I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable. And it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours. And then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 no. We're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network. I'm really excited today. I uh, have one of my favorite writers on the show. Uh, many people might not know who he is, even though he's 30 years old, has already written six books, uh, has one of the books uh, being made into a movie by Seth Rogen and another book being made into a movie by Jason Reitman. And he's doing a sitcom with one of my favorite actors, Jay Baruchel. So uh, we're going to have on the show today Simon Rich talking about not only his process, but what it takes to be funny, what's a comedy, and so on. So welcome to Simon Rich. By the way, this is just an intro, so we did, we, I'm recording this intro after the interview, so if it feels weird, don't worry about it. This is a great, uh, this is a cool building. Yeah, you should, uh, have you ever done like an audio book in here? Uh, I might have. They, they do I'm, a lot of audio books here. Yeah, yeah. So I've done some, some books here. Oh, cool. As long as everyone's comfortable and all that. Yeah, all good. Should be good. I'll bring in the water. Oh, thank you. And if you want coffee or anything, we got some outside. I'd love a cup of coffee. Is that all right? Yeah, thanks so much. Do just black coffee? Black's great. All right. Thank you. you good. I'm good, yeah. All right. Um, is this comfortable? Do you want to move around? I'm, I, this is a very light setup, this guy, so we can move it around if we need you. Know what uh, I mean? I'm good. Can you hear, as long as you can hear me? Uh... Yeah, I'll just set this up. Uh... Yeah. And I try to give you some sort of line of sight as best we could in this little space. But... Have you done a lot of podcasts or anything? I've done some. I, I, I've uh, done some too. Yeah. So. <laughs> yeah. I feel like it's they've really exploded and like the, it's like a huge... Uh, Last five years, like a real growth industry. Yeah, but at the same time, do you know anyone who's actually listened to a podcast? <laughs> I feel like, I, I mean, they must. I feel be like out everyone's there, right? doing one, but I don't know of anyone who listens to any. <laughs> I mean, uh, although to be fair, a lot of people download this podcast. I just don't know any of them. Uh -huh. Like so, <laughs> I haven't listened to any podcast. Oh yeah. So I listen to what do I listen to? Um, um, the. Uh, posting and toasting New York Knicks podcast sometimes. Okay. And um, I listen to um, uh, what's the the Jalen Rose one sometimes. 
I don't know. Yeah. A couple I, of, I listen to some basketball ones. I listen to some comedy ones, actually, like Mark oh. Maron. Oh, cool. WTF and um, yeah. The Nerdist with Chris Hardwick. I've heard of those, yeah. Yeah. And then I've tried Adam Carolla. Well, Adam Carolla is called on my podcast, uh-huh. and I probably should have listened to his po- podcast before then, but uh-huh. I didn't. Uh-huh. So I listened to it afterwards, though. I listened uh-huh. to Adam Carolla when he was, um, didn't he, he, he had like a sex, a sex call-in show, right? He had the the Man Show with Jimmy Kimmel, but I I thought he also maybe had like a radio like like early like yeah he had like Doctor Drew yes yeah, he was that on was Dr. him Drew. right yeah 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 when it was a radio show yeah I used to listen to that when I was a kid like on on you know FM radio now he uh, now he does podcasts mm-hmm. so in fact yeah. he does the Doctor Drew does a podcast too so I just want to make sure so we are we uh, are, are we recording now or yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, we're yeah, good. We're moving. Uh, Simon Rich having water. Having on, water on the podcast. Yeah, and, and the, coffee. Uh, coffee should be up. Oh, thanks. Appreciate it. So, so I've read all your books. Wow. Thank you. So, thanks for reading them. Yeah. No, they were hilarious. They were like, you know, how many times do you read a book where you start laughing in the middle of the book? <laughs> like seriously, how many books have there been? Oh, I, I could, I could name a bunch probably. I can't name that many. I can name your books. Oh, thank you. And. Uh, I can't re- name that many others. Um, Matt Groening, those li- those Life is Hell books, Love and Hell. Okay, yeah. Uh, but those are like comic strips. Yeah, comic <laughs> so they're, strips. They're, yeah. They're hey, intentionally made to make you laugh. Yeah. 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 So, what other like written books have made you laugh out loud? Like I've seen uh, some books that you've recommended in in other interviews. Yeah. And they're not like you, you're the, some of them are like serious hardcore books. Right. You know. Yeah. Well, you know, it's it's. And they uh, make you laugh. <laughs> well, I uh, laughter is such a you know it, like actual physical laughter um, is so subjective. I mean, it's it's like the physical response. It's it's hard to it's hard to it's sort of unfair to use that as a metric. I think like a lot of my a lot of my favorite writers, uh, and a lot of the writers that I think are the you know personally the funniest don't actually make me laugh out loud. Yeah, that's interesting because you look at like uh, take laughter as a metric. So you you were one of the youngest writers ever for Saturday Night Live. Clearly, the metric there is because it's a live yes, audience. Absolutely, is laughter. It's the only metric. I mean, you know, you, you do a dress rehearsal at 10 p.m. on Saturday night, um, and the show's two hours long at that point, and uh, and then Lauren cuts it to uh, to 90 um, in time for the 11:30 broadcast. And, and so they're doing the same sketches? Identical, yeah. Okay. And um, you make some some changes and some tweaks and cuts um, frantically, you know, at, at around 11 p.m. Um, to try to fix some some holes. But um, mostly that, at, at that point in the week, it's just cutting the sketches that got no laughs. Uh, so so I think at that show in particular, laughter is, is king. I mean, Lauren will, if he really believes in something, he'll put it on even if it got fewer laughs in another sketch. But... The laugh track is, you know, the, the actual physical volume of the crowd um, is about as important a rubric as any. And he, it's funny because so Lorne Michaels, who essentially created and is like the god of Saturday Night Live, mm-hmm. he famously doesn't laugh at anything, right? Like so when. Well, I, that's true, though, of all comedy writers. OK. Yeah. And Lorne, you know, is a comedy writer like he he, he is. not And now he's he's more known for being, uh, you know, an, an incredibly powerful and influential producer. But. Uh, he started off as a highly successful comedy writer. And I don't think I've ever met a comedy writer uh, who, who laughs. laughs at jokes. I wonder. So, you know, Jerry Seinfeld, you see him laughing at jokes. You know, like I've seen him on like Letterman. Well, he laughs at people. It's, it's a little different. I, I just, you know, I when I show a fa- you know, if, if, if we're in my writer's room, uh, which is a few, few blocks from here, and... I say to, you know, my staff, like, we should really watch this Mr. Show sketch because it's very similar to the premise that we're trying to pull off here. Let's learn from this great sketch. I'll play it. The entire room will watch it in silence. Huh. And then afterwards, everybody will say, that was brilliant. That was perfect. We have to copy it. We need to be more like it. But none of us will actually physically laugh. I mean, that's just the nature of the beast. You've seen everything so many times. That's funny, though, because so Mr. Show... Uh, I remember well because I did the website for Mr. Show. Oh, cool. And uh, I was working at HBO at the time, and it was 16 years ago. So how old were you? You must have – we were probably watching them. Oh, sure. I was uh, – yeah, I was 
14. So, and they were like, unbelievable, right? They blew your mind? Blew my mind, yeah. It was like the best sketch show on TV at the time, I think. Yeah, and there were a lot of good ones, too, uh, you know, at that time. But even among that crowd, it stood out to me anyway. I, I also was a huge fan of Kids in the, Kids in the Hall, which I, yeah. of course, was watching a little bit delayed because I was watching it, in, in, you know, in, in reruns on Comedy Central. Um, so in my brain, those shows were, were contemporaneous. I know that that's not true, but that's how I processed it. And then also The State, which yeah. had just ended around that time. Um, those three shows were just juggernauts. It seems like in the mid-90s, there was like this flurry of sketch shows and comedians that came out of the mid-90s that just sort of flourished after that. Like, and they were they were all performing on, like, the, the guys from the state, the whole, kids in the yeah. hall, they were all performing on Ludlow Street at the sure. time. Sure, sure. So, so I don't know if you ever went to those at the age of 14, but that, that no, was pretty hilarious. I, that Mark was, Maron was hosting right, a lot of those. Right, that was a little bit before my time. Um, I do remember early days of UCB in New York City. Uh, I went to some of those shows when I was in high school. Um, before. And those were in the, also performing on Ludlow Street. Right. Like Amy Poehler would be just this comedian out yeah. of nowhere performing on Ludlow Street. But I knew UCB mainly from their Comedy Central sketch show. Hmm. So I knew them more as a because I was a kid. I wasn't outgoing to these. these you weren't uh, drinking. No, I wasn't. I wasn't going to the clubs. Picking up but girls. Not really. But I was. Uh, I was watching. I was VHS taping hours of uh, Upright Citizens Brigade comedy off of Comedy Central. And... So, so that's interesting. So from an early age, did you know you wanted to be in comedy writing or or were you just fascinated by it? Like you just loved it more than any other kind of form of entertainment? Uh, it's both, right? It's sort of the same thing. You, uh, I think with, with most people who, who make stuff for a living, it, it, it starts off from being a fan, being an obsessive fan. And uh, if you love if you love love comic books and you read them obsessively for years and years odds are sooner or later you're going to try to draw a comic book or you know if you love guitar solos probably sooner or later you will pick up a guitar so it's hard to say where where one stops and one ends well okay so where where did it where did one end and one start for you like where when did you so you first were writing before Saturday night live even you were like writing for the New Yorker already so like what was like the first thing you wrote well, and before that, figured this was like funny um well before that i was writing for actually for mad magazine oh i didn't when know I was, that yeah when i was in college i i that and those were the first pieces i really published when i was uh yeah in my early 20s um but i uh i was ripping off my favorite comedy writers you know from the age of four or five i i remember by by six years old i was Passing off semi-plagiarized Roald Dahl stories as my own, you know, okay. to my teacher, and and uh, I was always trying to copy my my heroes. And did they did they uncover you? Did you did they unmask your pla- plagiarizing? Yeah, I would always get caught pretty quickly in those days. Now the, the, these days, I'm a little bit better at uh, at 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 hiding where I've stolen things from. So you know, because uh, there's the saying, of course, uh, good artists plagiarize and great artists steal. So. You know, you always have to kind of go for it. So no, no one ever knows, really. Well, my favorite premises are so old-fashioned that they've been done a million times. You know, my 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 favorite comedy games uh, are just are 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 thousands of years old. Like what, what? What do you mean by a comedy game? Like a character who is naively missing a key fact to their survival, or. Or, 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 you know, uh, uh, oh, go ahead. Uh, kind of a recurring character in, in your books is God. Sure. So, yeah, you know, right. And, and the, what you remove from God is not quite omnipotence because he's still like all powerful somehow, but you, you make him human. And that's the funny part. Like he's not, he's not God. Uh, yeah. He's not God-like. That's my favorite thing. I mean, you know, a, 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 a fallible figure who is responsible for everybody's life. I mean, but that's that's as old that that certainly goes back directly to Homer Simpson being, you know, safety in charge of safety for a nuclear power plant, but you can you can trace that back to, you know, a hundred other antecedents that are that are way older. You could probably trace it back to the Bible actually. Exactly. I mean, that was pretty brutal in the exactly, Bible. Exactly. Yeah, and you know, when I and when I was reading the Old Testament and and in Hebrew school, it, it that's something that did make me laugh out loud because I couldn't believe how 
how funny and, and irrational uh, some of his demands were. He literally goes up to a 99-year-old man, right? Already a conversation between a 99-year-old man and God sounds like a, you know, a, like a Monty Python premise. And he, and he says to him, you know, the first thing he says is, I'm God. You know, I, all the gods that you've been taught about are, are, are false and I am the one true God. So already that's, that's a big swing. Then Abraham buys in and then immediately, like literally like the second sentence he says is, now you have to circumcise yourself. <laughs> I mean, can you imagine? You're just like wandering well, okay, through the desert. You, you hear a laughed crazy... about that, but I didn't as a kid in Hebrew but school. But you're laughing about it now. I am laughing about it now because the way then you say he says, it. Then he goes, he goes even crazier. Then he, and Abraham crazily agrees to this. And then God says, this is like the third sentence he said to Abraham. He says, now you have to, and you have to circumcise every single man in your household, including all of your slaves. So now you have to picture Abraham like calling his, all his slaves together and saying like, "Hey guys, listen up! Like, spoke to the new God. You got to cut off your dicks." <laughs> I mean, what a crazy day that is for everyone, and it's nobody's fault. It's just the situation. Um, but that so those kinds of premises have always cracked me up. So it, it's funny though because there's definitely kind of a skill of observation there. Like so in Hebrew school, obviously we were all like, "Okay, God, did it. we were going to get tested on this." So mm. you had to just memorize what was happening. Sure, right. You couldn't take a step back. Yeah, right, and 90, say, ninety-nine years that old. That is right. screwed up. Like screwed what he's up. doing here. And talk about coming on strong. Hey, I'm God. Cut off your penis. I mean, right to the penis thing. Yeah, and then it doesn't First, stop. Then he had to kill his kid. Then really, yeah, he, he pulls it like, back at the end. Put his wife out into the woods. Exactly. Right. 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 It's nuts. And it never it never stopped actually. Like no, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, they were all any contact with God actually was a really screwed up situation. Really like if God up. was gonna come down to you in a burning bush, your life was over after that. Totally. Like Moses could have been like a prince and instead he he everything bad happened to him. Everything bad and yeah, and then he gets lost and then you know, for for decades. Decades of being lost for decades. Right. And then his reward was he had to see Israel but not go there. Yeah, exactly. So his life was just over as soon as the burning bush happened. And it was just all downhill. But, you know, it's funny because you don't really see, like, religion has taken sort of a back seat in American culture, I feel, in general. And you have quite a bit about, you know, your, your last novel was essentially about two angels who kind of fall in love while God is planning an Asian fusion restaurant. Right. And we're going to do the apocalypse first. Yeah. So yeah, what in God's name? Yeah, that's um, yeah. God decides to retire, um, to to pursue his first love, which is being a, a restaurateur, <laughs> and uh, he tells a couple of uh, angels. He he's got a. He, it's sort of like uh, heaven's depicted as like this gigantic, uh, conglomerate called Heaven Inc. And uh, God's kind of the out to lunch CEO, and he's got a inbox full of prayers that never get answered, and. Uh, most of the prayers are hopeless. You know, it's extremely difficult to answer the prayers. It requires a lot of technical skill, and God's more of an ideas man. And so he he tells a couple of plucky angels, you know, if you can answer one of these prayers, I'll I'll keep the earth open. And so they pick an easy one, they think, which is that two humans have prayed to be with one another. And uh, how hard can that be? They both want to hook up. So all they have to do is facilitate it, but the humans are so romantically inept that uh, uh, Earth ends up being in peril anyway. Yeah. No, that was that was hilarious. And then, now, so before Saturday Night Live, you also, you wrote your first book, uh, Ant, um, uh, the name? Uh, Ant Farm. Ant Farm, yeah. And it was almost like, they were almost like stand-up bits, I felt. Like, you, they were very short, like one or two pages each story, and each one kind of, it was like the classic kind of um, here's a premise and then here's a punchline sort of thing. Mm. Like I felt like you could have done this as stand-up. Did you ever consider doing stand-up? Stand-up is an extremely hard skill. You need to be really uh, – you need to be charismatic. You need to uh, be confident. You need to have good timing. Um, it's unbelievably difficult. I, you know, it, it, it's like uh, – one amazing thing is that you can be a hilarious stand-up co- comedian and not be a very good writer. You know, uh, it, it's it's such an amazing skill set that if you have that skill set and that alone, you can actually end up having a lot of success. And if you're both, if you happen to have both stand-up skills and comedy writing skills, 
then, I mean, you can be world famous, but um, uh, there isn't necessarily any overlap. Uh, mm-hmm. Most of the funniest, I know a lot of stand-up comedians who are brilliant writers, um, but, you know, you're kind of born into this world with a with various talents, and, and you don't really know what you're going to get. Uh, how do you know? you Have you tried stand-up? Like, how do you know? Uh... I, I, well, I, I, I just know myself to be a terrible performer. Um, I can tell from reading my pieces out loud uh, in front of people. I can, And also, you know, you, usually stand-up comedians, they love performing. You know, just like just like how I love writing. I wake up in the morning and I'm really excited to to sit down and write. That's I can't wait to do it. Whereas the thought of going up on a stage in front of a lot of people is I find really scary. Stand ups don't actually stand ups are excited. They can't wait to get on stage. That's that's like a baseball player playing baseball. So it's it's a, a very, very different thing than, than I do. Do you write every day? Yeah. Seven days a week? Mm-hmm. First thing in the morning? Mm-hmm. Like so, you wake up and are, do you do you do kind of the Hemingway technique of okay, I'm going to finish the day before knowing what the next sentence is, so that you're all ready to go, or do you have no idea? Do you try to start from scratch on, on an idea when you wake up? I it varies. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, it depends on what I'm doing. Like if I'm in the middle of a screenplay, then like yeah, I know that the next day it's going to probably be the next scene in the in the screenplay. But um, uh, if I'm between projects then yeah it'll be that that's when i that's when i write new stuff so so i just kind of want to give some some highlights because we jumped right into it you've written like i want to say six books is that right uh the last one spoiled brats i don't even think it's available in the u.s yet no like it's, yeah a few it more published in the uk mm, yeah and i i read part of it i read uh sellout which was in the new yorker cool um so that was like a novella and it was very different from I felt it was very different from your prior books, but we'll we'll talk about that in a second. So then you were the you've also been one of the youngest writers of Saturday Night Live. You did that for like three years, two years, four, four years. Okay, so longer than I thought. Then you were at Pixar working on God knows what. Like the la- the interview I saw, you, you weren't allowed to even talk about what you worked on. Are you still not allowed to talk about what you worked no, on? No, I can't. Yeah. Has the movie come out, or is it not coming out? Or I can't say a thing. You yeah, can't say a I thing. know it makes it sound much cooler than it is, but it's it's, it's just, like the CIA. I know exactly. Yeah. And then now you're um you're working on a, a sitcom, and, right. and plus two of your two of your books are being looked at as as by for for movies. So Seth Rogen uh, bought the rights of one, I guess, and Jason Sell Reitman. Sellout, yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh, Seth Rogen bought Sellout? Yeah, him and Evan Goldberg, yeah. Uh, that's really interesting. So who's going to play uh, uh, the the Simon character and the great-grandfather? Who are going to, do you Good know? Good question. Yeah, we're, we're still trying to, we're working that out. Are you so when you say you're working on a screenplay? Do you work on these things? Do they let you? Are they going to let you write the screenplay, or is Seth Rogen going to write the screenplay? I'm I'm writing uh, that screenplay. Okay. Yeah. I'm, yeah. That's what I was working on this morning. Okay. Great. Yeah. Um. But um. Yeah. That's a fun one. It's uh. It's it's uh. It's been it's it's been great working with those guys. They're really smart. Really funny. I'm really grateful that they they won't, they are taking a chance on something as weird as a uh, as that as that story and it's a little different for them too i think like first off my all-time favorite movie of all time is super bad which is yeah Seth Rogen and evan goldberg yeah so they're incredible they're great I mean, I've and been they've been doing it since they were kids basically mm-hmm, mm-hmm. you know there's like a youtube thing with seth rogan at his doing stand-up like at the age of 13 right right so, uh and 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 in he, I guess he practiced stand up also a bit uh, for funny people. Mm-hmm. So, which was very funny. But uh, uh, so, what was the what? What's the other one? What's the Jason Reitman one? That was uh, he. He bought the rights to uh, my first novel, which was uh, called Elliot Allagash. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Very very funny. So Elliot Allagash. The premise is there's a guy who's that a nerd. One. And there's another guy who's super rich who does this Pygmalion type thing. He's going to make the nerdy kid cool. Yeah, it's this it's this evil teenager named Elliot, and he's been um, he's been expelled from every school in the world. Um, and his dad is 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 the richest man on earth, so he just perpetually is buying him into new prep schools. And this time, uh, his dad has given so much money to the school in question that he literally cannot get expelled. For the first time, he's stuck at at a school. Um, and so for sport uh, as a game, uh, but really because he's lonely and wants a friend, we find out uh, he systematically uh, 
takes the least popular kid and turns him into the most popular kid as a, you know, it is in classic My Fair Lady style. Um, and it's very expensive, but, uh, uh, and, and, and there are a lot of hijinks and, yeah, like, so, we, got, yeah, like, pretty, like pretty we all wish we had like an Elliot Allagash yeah, in our lives. Yeah, he's like a fairy godmother. Yeah, but uh, yeah, but but it turns bad. It turns bad. Yeah, <laughs> as these things do. Yeah, yeah. So like that's that's a, that's an extremely old story. Uh, a lot of a lot of what I do is just like taking an old story that I love and have seen a million times and just trying to do it in a in my own way. That's really how I look at it. I think like okay, like I, you know. So what was the old story there? Like what's a classic? Uh, that's example. like a. Cl- I mean, we we see, of course, Judy Bloom, sure, you know, or any kind of young adult novels right, right, right. as that sort of premise. Right. But what was the? What would you say is the most close to that that you were able to kind of make a slight comic twist? And here we go. Uh, well, My Fair Lady, obviously, yeah. Pygmalion, um, and uh, I would say for that one. Uh, any sell your soul to the devil story, you know, from Doctor Faustus to Damn Yankees, anything where a character uh, is at the bottom of the ladder and and says, "Man, I will do anything to get to the top." And then you know the you see the the flash of smoke and and the evil charismatic devil appears and says, "You know anything?" And and then you're off to the races. It's just it's just such a fun starting point for a story um i feel like that happens a lot like for instance south park sure all the time so yeah yeah yeah. they do it twilight zone simpsons i mean everyone has has milked that premise um uh it's it's a lot of fun gosh i should start stealing from your stuff maybe i'll write uh some funny stuff i'll like just go through each thing <laughs> so yeah i mean some people are even more re- re- reductionist of it. some people say that there are only like two plots or three i think there's more like a dozen but, well, well, I could see at least three or four in your stuff. So there's kind of like the nerdy kid who's trying to figure out the world. Mm-hmm. Okay, so that happens a lot mm-hmm. in your in your books, particularly the earlier ones. Mm-hmm. Then you transitioned, and now it's like guy in twenties in a relationship, and things can go wrong. And and like you, it's sort of like you take common problems and relationships and then move them to into an extreme situation and then th- that's the comedy it's like so for instance the guy who meets a girl in a bar goes home with her spends the night and that's such an incredible thing he gets a call from the president the next day right and he wins a macarthur genius prize yeah yeah for 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 uh successfully wooing a girl at a, at a bar yeah she becomes the face of dior yeah she also gets a, a, yeah. a lot of attention for her for her achievement too yeah they they both become international celebrities so did you think of that like when you were sitting in a bar and like gosh i just can't it's impossible to meet a girl uh well with all these stories it's sort of like you start off with um a visceral emotion that i start off with like a visceral emotion that i have felt and if i think that it's universal if i think it's something that probably is not unique to my own experience then i'll try to write about it um, and the way I try to write about it is by coming up with a very high stakes, usually supernatural premise, which will get across how extreme that emotion feels. You know, so I, I try to write about emotions uh, that I've experienced, not in the way that they actually occurred, but in the way that they felt. So, you know, when you pick up, a, when you meet somebody new and it goes well, uh, that's a pretty low stakes, boring story. But when you're in it, when you're living it, it, it feels about as high stakes as as anything could be. So that's why that character gets a congratulatory call from the from the president because that's how that's how it feels to him. Well, and and so that was in the, that was in the last girlfriend on earth, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so so then there was um there was another story where a guy's about to. Um, decide whether he's going to go into a long-term relationship or not, and he goes to like a boot camp to right. convince him not to like the, or he goes to like a prison. He's scared straight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So he, um, he's, uh, yeah, that's about a, a guy who's like on the verge of entering a. He, he's he's entering a serious long-term relationship with with a woman, and uh, he's really on the path towards marriage. And uh, he, uh, and he and a bunch of other young boyfriends. Um, find themselves in a in a scared straight program where um, instead of getting a tour of prison, they're getting a tour of uh, the suburbs 
and yeah. married life, and what and they're they, and they're forced to look at you know Bed Bath and Beyond, and and, uh, <laughs> and you make fun of like uh, have, the guy says, "Have you ever read Juno Diaz before?" And uh, <laughs> right, they're gonna they're they're told that they're gonna have to join book clubs, and 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 they're sort of their faces are rubbed in the in the misery of a uh, of, of of monogamous married yuppie life, and then and they end up all getting out of Dodge and, and breaking up with their, their girlfriends. And what was the final... There was a final triggering event that scared this guy into tears, the the one, the main protagonist of that story. I, I, you know, it's it's really... T- it's, I, I don't even remember what it was because... You write so many stories, so it's hard to kind of, like, remember each one. Yeah. Yeah, and, I, and also I, I then will change it for... So, like, that's now... That scene is now in an episode of the, of the sitcom that I'm doing. And so it's been... Rewritten and adapt and adapted, so I. Oh, that's funny. I'm, I'm so, so far from yourself. <laughs> call constantly, yeah. Every chance I get. Yeah, because ultimately, like, if there's, let's say, there's four premises, you've yeah. got to figure out a different way to slice each premise. Exactly. So, like, for instance, we talked about. So, let's say there's the the God is human story yes. mixed with the relationship story. So, so you have one story, and I think this is also in the Last Girlfriend mm-hmm. on Earth. Um, you have one story where God um, is creating the Earth one day at a time, and it's good, and you're using biblical language, and then suddenly his. Um, girlfriend is very upset he's spending so much time on his earth he doesn't want to correct her it's a universe and <laughs> yeah. she just wants to go see the Muppets or right whatever. right yeah well that's that's right that's about a kind of uh, selfish character in his 20s who doesn't make time for his girlfriend and is, is you know is too is too work centric um, and he you find out in the story that he's also God so his his particular job is to create this universe um, but he learns that he learns to have some more work-life balance by the end. <laughs> so just that premise is funny. God with a work-life balance. Right, yeah. So it's the intersection of premises that become funny. Yeah. Would it's... you say it's losing a, a premise or intersection? Because like a lot of times the, uh, the comedy comes from um, God loses a skill. For instance, uh-huh. loses, the, uh-huh. loses the ability to be the most universally powerful person in the universe. Like Because now his girlfriend has power over him. Sure, so sure. So he, he lost his skill there. Or is it the intersection of girlfriend-boyfriend dynamics with the Bible? That's interesting. I, I think those are two ways of, of those are two ways of, of putting it. I think they're, they're, those are both right. You know, like, it's, uh, those are both good ways of describing it. It's, it's you know, at the, at the core of any comedy premise, there needs to be, I think, some vulnerability somewhere. Somebody has to be weak. Um, and uh, Like a non-hero. Uh, most heroes usually have a weakness, right? You know, uh, usually they, uh, I, I think for something the, to be- The Rock never has a weakness. Except for The Rock. Except for The Rock. He's always killing it. Yeah. Although he likes little boys. He, a uh, little boy, you know, like uh, if, if he suddenly adopts a son, uh, or a son mm-hmm. is dropped off in his apartment. Absolutely. Yeah. I, I, Hollywood's usually pretty good about giving every, giving all their heroes a, a bit of, uh, vulnerability. So 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 now, how did this uh, sitcom? Oh, oh no! First, I wanted to ask you about uh, the sellout. So, oh, yeah. uh, because this is another premise which was very unique to you, actually. Like, I feel like mm-hmm. you sort of grow up in spoiled brats, mm. uh, w- w- and starting with this novella, the the sellout. He, you, the main character, it has nothing to do with, you know, relationships or anything like that. This this the main protagonist. Uh, becomes friends in this, as you say, this fantastic way. He suddenly becomes friends with his great great grandfather or great grandfather who who moves forward in time to the, so they're the same age and they can become pals with yeah, each other. Yeah, yeah, it's 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 uh, it's it's autobiographical. It's it's um it's about my ancestor, this guy named Herschel, and he um he's a hard scrabble Jewish immigrant uh, from Eastern Europe, and he. Uh, comes to this country with very little, and uh, in the in the story, and this is where it gets fictional. He uh, is working at his uh, job at the pickle factory, and he falls into a vat of pickles, and uh, the lid gets closed over him by mistake, and he's brined for a hundred years. And so, when he emerges from the pickle brine in, in present day Brooklyn, he uh, is he's un, he hasn't aged a day, and so he's able to meet me. And in the story, we're both the same age; we're both twenty seven. But we have very different takes on the world and very different uh, skill sets. And he's, you know, understandably horrified that uh, 
his uh, his great great grandson has turned into a, uh, uh, a something as frivolous as a as a comedy writer. Yeah, so so it was very funny, and then he becomes this entrepreneur, like kind sure. of a, yeah. a hardworking guy. Yeah. But in, yeah. in, in present day society, a hardworking guy could could find himself stumbling into great wealth. That's right. Yeah, and he's sort of uh, unwittingly becomes a kind of hipster icon uh, to the people of Brooklyn, and and. Uh, uh, ends up ends up achieving great fame and fortune. Yeah. So so and is and, this... and eclipsing his and eclipsing the Simon Rich character. So 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 this is the one where the movie's in in the works, but uh, kind of in the script writing phase. Right. Yeah. Exactly. And now, so what are you working on? So you're working on the sitcom with Jay. B- B- I don't know how to say his last name. Uh, Baruchel. Yeah. Yeah. Baruchel. I loved him in This Is the End. Yeah. Which is like the funniest movie after Super Bad that I've ever seen. Which is which, which is, is also Seth, Seth Rogen. Seth and Evan. Yeah. Work. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah he's phenomenal. Uh, he's uh, and that movie's great. I think. Um, he. Uh, yeah. He's he's the star of our show, and he's fantastic. Did he? I feel like. He's an interesting character because he's very funny. He was great in Undeclared, which also had Seth Rogen in it as right. an actor, right? Uh, which I guess is where they became friends, or maybe they were friends before then. I don't know. But he was great. He was the main character of Undeclared, which had ran, I think, only one season. Mm-hmm. And then he was in a couple of movies, which were, you know, kind of hits or minor hits or whatever. But he never like hit the stratosphere like Seth Rogen did. Uh, but he's a hilarious guy. How did it? How did it come to be this sitcom? Uh, well, I um, so so it's based on the last girlfriend on earth. Uh, the show is has a different title. The show is called Man Seeking Woman, um, and uh, I wanted to do it as a as a full sitcom as opposed to as a sketch show. You would you know you would you would uh, assume that a a show that's based on a collection of thirty stories. Um, would be a sketch show, but it, I, I decided I wanted to do it as a sitcom because I felt that uh, audiences um, have like a uh, have a tendency to kind of uh, write off sketch shows, and they they they, uh, they don't allow themselves to be emotionally compelled by sketch shows. Yeah, like um, other than Saturday Night Live, what sketch show? Exists now, and I mean there are a couple on Comedy Central. Oh, they're great ones. Kroll show, yeah, Kroll and and Key and Peele and Amy Schumer. Schumer. Yeah, these are all great shows. But but, outside of Comedy Central, um, oh, I think there's there's and Broad City is uh, Broad City is a proper sitcom, but there there's um, uh, I think there's a lot of great sketch stuff out there, but I, I meant more just like it's strange. There are a lot of like moving scenes on Mr. Show, for example. Um, but, um, people would never describe the show as emotionally resonant because I think because characters are changing identities so rapidly and they're putting on different wigs, uh, you're constantly reminded that it's fake. And when, and, and, um, when that's happening as an audience member, you're less likely to allow yourself to get sucked into, to the emotional, uh, aspects of the story. So um, since this is this, these stories that I wrote were about love, since they're, since they're love stories, I just wanted to make sure that audiences would be willing to kind of go into those waters with me. So I had yeah. to make it into a sitcom. And, and it doesn't really, I mean, you look at something like, let's say Family Guy, you know, that's almost like a sketch show, uh-huh. except everybody is the same character. You know, they're yeah, just playing and, different and, sketches over and over again. Right. But because they are the same characters, people are People start to develop a rapport with the character. They start to, right. to feel like uh, they've developed a kind of relationship with, you know, with with Peter and they and and Stewie, and and they get to know them, and and that allows them to um, have emotional connections to the to the to the work. Whereas like SNL, um, even if there's an extremely moving sketch, um, it might never be repeated. Yeah, I think people uh, on so, watching yeah. SNL become loyal to the actors. They were, exactly, they become loyal to the actors in the way that, right? But that takes years and years and years because the actors again are constantly putting on crazy facial prosthetics and and bizarre wigs. So it takes you like two or three years of close viewing to even be able to differentiate the different performers. So it, it and and, it, and that's and that's like the big. That that's why everybody always dislikes uh, SNL when the cast changes. Hmm. Because um, they always think that it's 
the cast's fault, which is a a funny um, misconception. It's it's really and it happens each time, every single time, like every yeah. four years, people hate SNL. Yeah, every new cast member has been hated since since you know since nineteen eighty. Yeah. Uh, but the reason why people um, you know hated Bill Murray when he started or hated Will Ferrell when he started um, is because they literally physically did not recognize him. And uh, whereas with the sitcom, you're able to say, like, this is Bill Cosby. And by, you know, episode two, three, you really know who that guy is. He plays the same character for every minute of the show. It, right. it, it, Even though there's no real arc across the shows, like they're really just doing another, the, the same family is doing another sketch in some sense. Mm-hmm. You do feel this emotional connection to yeah. who they represent. And it's really as simple as he always has the same sweater kind of, and he is always in the same house and he always has the same wife. It really is on that. It really is that simplistic. So are you having a fun time with this sitcom? It's it's a blast. Yeah. And it's uh, it's. It's just like uh, I feel so lucky to work with the uh, the people who are doing it with me. It's it's Jay's brilliant. He's like a, a unbelievably talented actor and hilarious, obviously, but also just really naturalistic and versatile. And he's just I, I the show would certainly not work without him. Um, Does he help uh, with the writing at all? Do you find that happening? Uh, it's pretty. It's you know. It's it's such a. It's it's such a. Um, the the the. It's interesting. We 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 find ourselves really talking about uh, not so much the 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 nitty gritty of like uh, you know what dialogue is on the page, but um, we do talk a lot about our personal experiences when we're crafting the show because it's so important for it to be. As as universal and relatable as possible, so uh, everybody I think uh, involved from from the writers to the cast to the directors um, to the producers are, are are coming into it with their with their own um, with their own emotional uh, stories. So do you, and and this you have a writing staff for, and are they like pitching different show ideas, or everything's just purely based on the first thirty stories? Uh... Oh, it's like um, of those, probably only about half are really truly adaptable because so much of them were like really genre parodies right. that kind of require text. Uh, so most of the material is brand new. So, 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 so the writing staff pitches ideas to you, and you decide what's good and what's bad. Like, how does it work within the writing room? The writing room is, uh, and again, this is like just. It's it's an unbelievable group of writers, and I, I just uh, every every day at work, I'm just blown away that I get to work with these people. Um, Do you feel they, funny if some of them are older than you? Um, you know, it's like uh, you kind of forget about that stuff because 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 uh, and, and and also it the the way that we work, it's so collaborative. Um, it's uh, a lot of the episodes are co-written, and um, we really. It it feels more like being in a rock band than it, it does like being like boss of a show. And and this is going to go on. Uh, do you know what? Uh, I, I forgot what network this is going on. Uh, FXX. Oh, great! Yeah, my favorite. Yeah. So so I was worried you were going to say like CBS or something. <laughs> so FXX with the uh, the the league. It's always sunny in Philadelphia. Right, Louis. right. Uh, they uh, Peter Ligori the head, is still the head of the network. I think I forget. Um, but. Uh, uh, they seem to have the most original stuff on TV right now. They've been they've been great um, for us. I I, they, I I've never had a better experience with with uh, with a network. They are just super trusting and supportive. And yeah, it's a weird show. I mean, it's a traditional sitcom in the sense that it's you know it's about this character played by Jay Baruchel, who is um, a lovelorn guy in his twenties, and he is uh, getting over heartbreak and trying to meet the right the right someone and he has his best friend and he has his sister and he has his parents and he has his dead end job. It's a very, very by the book conventional sitcom. Um, but it's, you know, there's, there's time travel and there's, uh, there's alien apocalypses and there's a lot of murder and there's a lot of, uh, there, there are trolls, there are, uh, there are, there are devils, there are trips to the underworld. Um, so, there are a lot of strange elements uh, that that, and it's miraculous that they've let us get away with it. 
What, when's, when do you think it'll come out? Um, I, think, I think it's supposed to come out in early 15. Huh. So oh, like, I can't uh, wait for that. Yeah, we're going to Toronto now to, to, sh- to shoot it. Oh, okay, shooting in Toronto. I think that's where Jay's from, right? Yeah. So that'll be the fun Serendipitous, yeah. He's from Montreal, uh, but he, he lives in Toronto now. Huh. Yeah. So I remember in This is the End, I guess he's coming from Canada to visit his pal Seth Rogen is right. the premise. And, right, yeah. But he wants to be out of that whole Hollywood scene. He, yeah. And he ends up like in the middle of... The apocalypse there. <laughs> right, exactly. There's some parallels between that movie and our show, you know, because it's, it's um, obviously like high stakes supernatural elements, but but the movie's really about the relationships between the, the characters. So I've, I've seen you use this word high stakes in a couple of different interviews. So like, it's sort of like you say, I take an emotional reaction and there's some high stakes element to it. So like obviously male female relationships are all high stakes sure, when yeah, you're in them. Absolutely. And God's high stakes and uh uh and then do something to it. Like mi- mix it up in some way. Like what's what's for you you've been watching so much comedy since you were a little kid. Maybe maybe it's just natural, but like what do you what's the switch that makes it comic, do you think? Oh, uh, that's it's a really good question. High into comedy. Um, it's a thin line. I mean, you know, uh, uh, I think there's a, it's a real, real thin line between comedy and horror, for example. Um, a lot of my favorite writers kind of do both, like, like, uh, Shirley Jackson, you know, when you're reading some of her stories, you you don't know whether you're supposed to laugh or scream sometimes. I feel Probably the lottery is not very funny, but. uh, Well, at the same time, like, you know. All right, give give me your your version. I mean, you know, for me, the, 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 it, it wouldn't take that many sentences to, to flip it, you know, it, all you'd have to do is be like, have somebody say, like, hey, I won. All right, great. So, what, <laughs> all right. What, what did I win? You know, and then all of a sudden you're, and it's like, why, why is everybody looking at me? Is it, is it a car? It's a car, right? I mean, you know, it doesn't take that much to flip something. Same thing with Stephen King. Like, a lot of his premises can be flipped. The Simpsons has been doing it for years, all their Halloween specials. You just take a classic Twilight Zone premise, a high stakes Twilight Zone's premise, and you just tweak it really very slightly and all of a sudden you've got a great comedy premise um okay so let's take the guy who um who, who the famous one where he he's in a, a vault when the world ends sure and then he ends up trying to um collect all these books and he's right. happy that no one's bothering him and then right when he sits down to read his glasses break and his, his lifelong dream is over right so played for you know played played as a uh as like an O. Henry, I guess like a serious O. Henry style twist story, right? Like, right. and, and uh, so much of that is just the music and the performance. Um, whereas, you know, with some some tweaks and trims, you could turn that into like a Far Side cartoon, probably. Yeah, yeah, interesting. So, what, what out of um, Family Guy, Simpsons, South Park, what's your favorite? Uh, it's sort of unfair to compare those shows. I feel you know it's like comparing like the. You know the the Beatles and like the Kinks and like the Smiths. It's like you have to kind of it, the they, they're they're so influential on one another uh, that I guess it's true. And they're very they all refer to each other. Sure, and and just the these aren't shows that came out in the same year. You know, these are shows that came out. Uh, it, you have to look at them in context, um, and. Uh, f- Obviously, the, the Simpsons is the, you know, the the godfather of of comedy. I think as as, yeah. I, as I know it in the world. Um, I saw in one interview you would watch like five Simpson episodes a day. Yeah, I, I for me that pretty much everything I think I know or, or everything I believe about comedy I, I learned from The Simpsons. So Most you really kind of yeah. went through your almost like uh, this virtual apprenticeship on on comedy by just immersing yourself in so much like The Simpsons, Mr. Yeah. Show, Saturday Night Live. But above all The Simpsons, um, you know, I loved all these shows and I loved reading Funny Writers and I loved The Onion and I loved reading Douglas Adams, but not, none of this, com- all this pales in comparison to The Simpsons. Um, the Simpsons really is, in, in my mind, the, the most perfect uh, work of art. Have you ever tried writing for them? No, I've never tried to write for them. But Ian Maxstone Graham is working for Man Seeking Woman, 
working for my sitcom, which is hugely amazing. Ah, so he used to work on The Simpsons? I didn't know that. Oh, yeah, for, for you know, a decade plus. Huh. And he's he's a brilliant, brilliant writer. And um, in the room, I'll, you know, I'll constantly say, like, no, we need to make this scene more like this very, very specific, you know, joke or scene or premise on the on this on the Simpsons episode. And often Ian will remember when, you know, he or somebody else wrote it, which is a totally surreal experience. So so you mentioned earlier your your discipline, like you wake up, you start writing uh, just right away. And then what throughout the day, like what what happens like later in the day? Um, like you take care of business? Or? Yeah. Later in the day is like, you know, interviews like this or <laughs> uh, reading reading scripts or watching auditions. It's sort of the, the sort of non-writing aspects of, of my job. Because people are auditioning for both the movie and the um, sitcom? Yeah, or whatever's going on at the, at the moment. And then in the evening, do you go to sleep early because you know you're going to have to write the next day? Do you start to get anxious, what am I going to write the next day? I... Well, that's like well, I I never get anxious about what I'm going to write because it, if 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 I don't have anything to work on, that's when I get to come up with something new, which is also which is its own kind of right. fun, exciting experience. Well, like when you were when you started uh, uh, the sellout, were you thinking, gosh, I've already sliced and diced man meets women, you know, so many times. I've got to come up with something, some new twist, or did it just? I mean, you can write a you can write the same story for your whole life. I mean, look at look at Philip Roth, right? I mean, you can yeah. you can just keep keep going on a, on a couple of themes for for. I've only written six books. I, I, some of my favorite writers. Okay, written, only written six books. You're age thirty, so obviously you're <laughs> but, prolific. But some of my favorite writers have written you know twenty or thirty books, and they're all basically about the same thing. Yeah, I guess that's right. Philip Roth, you could kind of define, and Philip Roth, John Updike, Saw Bell, that whole '60s crew, you could sort of say they all wrote the same story over and over again. And uh, yeah, I mean, think about how many novels. The same story. I mean, I'm not a huge Updike fan, but you know, think about how many uh, solid stories and, and novels he wrote about infidelity. Yeah. Or like, look at, um, you know, another another one of my heroes is. Um, is uh, Douglas Adams, right? And and all those books are essentially the same. I mean, you forget where one starts and where one ends. Yeah. Um, in my in my mind, they all kind of bleed together into a single into a single awesome story. And kind of Kurt Vonnegut does Kurt that Vonnegut, too. yeah, exactly. He'll he literally makes fun of that. Like he'll bring yeah, characters from one and put them yeah. in another. Another great write, another one of my favorite writers. He'll yeah, he'll he'll reference he'll literally reference pre- premises. You mentioned. Um, uh, in one of your things, uh, T.C. Boyle is one of yeah, your favorite short story love writers. T.C. Boyle. He's, he's one of mine as well. I don't consider him necessarily like a comedy writer, mm-hmm. um, but, but he's like definitely like an above and beyond talent. Yeah, he's one of my favorites. Uh, another example of, uh, uh, you know, is it comedy? Is it horror? Is it somewhere in between? And, like, you know, the truth is it doesn't really matter. It's it's gripping. It's visceral. It's high stakes. Uh, it's emotional and it draws you in. You you want to keep flipping the pages. Yeah, he's he's fantastic and and uh, uh, all of his stories. I mean, and and some of the historical novels too. I mean, I love I love Drop City and and I love Road to Wellville. Um, but his stories are my favorite. Uh, if there ever was whiskey, um, Greasy Lake, Descent of Man. Greasy Lake is one of uh, maybe top five short stories of all time. Oh, it's so good. What about the story? What about the Hector Quesadilla story? That's a great one. I don't think I've read that one. Yeah, he's got a, a bunch of awesome sports stories, and then Stephen King, of course, is also another uh, premise king. All my favorite writers, all the sort of all the writers that I look up to and try to rip off are are, are premise writers. You know, they're 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 the writers who give you a a strong hook at the beginning. So it's it's. Uh, or towards the beginning. <laughs> yeah. So it's it's always going to be for me. It's going to be like uh, Flannery O'Connor and and Shirley Jackson, uh, uh, as opposed to uh, Updike. What about like a Raymond Carver, where the yeah. hook is very subtle? It's not for me. Yeah. Yeah. yeah uh, I I respect it. It's extremely hard to do, but um, my favorite stuff is more like uh, you know, P.G. Woodhouse or or uh, or Ray Bradbury. Yeah. Or Philip Dick. You know, just. So there's a concept and there's characters. Yes. As opposed to being just purely character driven. Right. That that stuff for me is I'm impressed by it, but yeah, like uh it's not 
it's not where I live. Like, like, who, a, like who do you read where you're so enraptured that it just it's like you you read and then you get up and start writing? Um, for me, uh, I guess I've probably talked about most of my favorites, but but Raul Dahl for me is is um, his stories, his short stories are I think that's like every, everything I write is just trying to copy that as much as possible. Huh, I've never read any of his short stories. They're they're um they're twist stories. They're they're constructed a little bit like O. Henry stories, but they're not sanctimonious and and uh, they're not like moralistic. They're just like ripping yarns that you can't put down. They're mm-hmm. amazing. I I'd start with um, I, I I think the Modern Library maybe put out like a huge like a big ass collection of his. That, Everything he does is unbelievable. His, his children's books are also fantastic. He's fit. Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. So good, yeah, it's great. So he's he's probably my favorite writer. And then uh, you like you mentioned Douglas Adams, Kurt Vonnegut, mm-hmm. T.C. Boyle, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the Love Simpsons. Those guys. The Simpsons, yeah, the Simpsons above all. Simpsons above all of these writers. Simpsons above Mr. Show. Oh, definitely. But again, it's like how can you know the? It's not like David Cross had never watched The Simpsons. You know, it's right. All these guys have, I, I, I imagine, were at least somewhat influenced by. So, so have you ever been disappointed in your career? Like, it seems like from the get go, you were, you, you were writing for the New Yorker. You published a collection of short stories. SNL loved the story so much that you became a cast writer. Then Pixar. Now you're doing a movie and a sitcom. It's sort of like you have like this ideal kid's career. Mm. Like, if, like every twelve year old would want this career when they grew up. I certainly feel really grateful that I get to do it. I, uh, I, um, uh, every single day when I wake up and I don't have to go to a, a normal job and I get to just sit and write like I did when I was a kid, uh, it's, I, I, I feel like it's a miracle. I, I feel super lucky I get to do it. So what would you recommend for someone? Let's say someone is 30, okay, and they've been in a cubicle all their life. And or whether they've been a lawyer or whatever, but they also liked The Simpsons when they were younger. They also liked all these things, and they love comedy, and they they think they have it in them to be a writer. Is there any advice for them, or is it too late? Um, I don't think it's ever too late for anyone to do anything. I mean, you know, it's it's. Uh, but I but I uh, I will say that if you don't love sitting down and writing, you sh- you definitely shouldn't do it for a living because that's mostly what it is. You know, like if if you if if you are. St- stuck in a boring job and every single night you can't wait to get home because the job stinks and all you really want to be doing is sitting down and writing a novel, then that's somebody who should keep plugging away at it right. and keep writing every day and, and you know, and and, not, and never give up, et cetera. But if you kind of just like in the back of your mind think that you would like to sit down and write. I, I, my, I'll never do it. My, well, my, my suggestion would be to sit down and write and see if you really like it. I mean, what's the, the great Laurie Moore story? It's in a self-help, you know, uh, How to Be a Writer, I think it's called. Uh, um, but, you know, her, her advice in that, in that story is try to do anything else first. Yeah, interesting. You know, so, like, that, so that's a collection <laughs> of stories that came out, what, like 20 years ago? So you're... You're really up on your, all of your short story writers. Like, do you read? How, how much do you read? I uh, I read a lot. I I really like to read. I read mostly. Uh, I would say, these days, probably mostly nonfiction. But um, like what? I love uh, Alec Wilkinson. I love uh, John Ronson. Uh, uh, yeah, you know, but those are almost like literary nonfiction. Like they're kind of nonfiction, but it's not. Uh, I wouldn't say it's uh it's narrative nonfiction. Yeah. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah. I like uh I read a lot of biographies. Um uh Yeah, I like uh you know, again, it's the same the same reason I read everything cuz it's like a high stakes crazy story. Now now do you feel with uh the sitcom did you go back and read okay, what's a typical 30 minute or 22 minute sitcom. Oh, absolutely, like, yeah. So there's a uh, so so what are the elements? There's like an A B C story. What's well, the... our our show, not to get too technical cuz it's always so boring to deconstruct these things, but our our show is a little bit unusual in that it really centers around a single guy's 
journey. It's closer to a show like, you know, Louie or, or, or Curb Your Enthusiasm because it, it really is about the uh, trials and tribulations of one guy. It's but not still a, like two or three things happening. Yes, but it's it's uh, it's a very it's very laser focused on our star, um, which which uh, it's not an ens- it's not an ensemble show in the way that Friends is. You know, where where in any given episode, you know, you'll have sev- multiple plots. Right. It's 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 very much about following the trajectory, the emotional arc of our of our hero. And so, okay, so now I get technical. Like, what, what, what's one level below that? Uh, what do you mean? In terms of, like, story structure. One level below that. Like, like, like you said you didn't want to get too technical. Uh, oh, you want, oh, like, like, well, I mean, then you get into things like, um... Like, is there a first act, second act, third act? Oh, sure, yeah, yeah, then, you, yeah, you get into, the, the, there's, there's, yeah, right, you, you have to make sure that there's a, the act breaks, um have momentum so that the person will want to keep watching you have to you have to make sure that um or at least i like to um i like to make sure that um you have to because i feel like there's like limited uh attention in in general like let's say you're reading a book how often do you feel like okay i'm done with this chapter i'm going to check my email again or i'm going to check twitter or i'm going to check facebook right i mean well exactly that's 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 all i'm thinking about whenever i write anything whether it's a, a novel or a story or a or an episode of a TV show. All I'm thinking is, how do I, how do I get somebody to keep watching or reading this, um, and not, and not check their phone? You know, and and um, I think if they check their phone, it's not because their attention span is short and they're stupid. I think it's because I did a bad job as a as a storyteller. So you almost need like a cliffhanger at the end of every line in a in a weird way. I try to, uh-huh. I try to. It doesn't have to necessarily be a literal cliffhanger where it's like. You know, is he going to live or die? Although that's one of my favorite tricks. Um, it could be a um, a joke that makes them laugh. That usually will keep somebody reading. Um, could be like a, a emotional uh, cliffhanger where you know you're invested in the character's journey and you don't know which decision they're going to make. Um, there, there's a lot of ways to. You could scare the scare the shit out of the reader, as Stephen King does every like couple of pages. Right. There's there's a lot of ways to to keep to keep somebody uh you know to keep their nose in the book, but um uh you gotta you gotta keep them there because because then they'll if if you don't they'll run. <laughs> so so what's uh what's the next thing now? Is this Spoiled Brats coming out in the U.S. soon? Uh yeah. So Spoiled Brats um comes out here. I think in like in like a month. Okay, all right. Yeah, I, I, I ordered October. it somehow, but maybe I got cool. it from like a used uh, a used, someone who's who got it in the UK and right. It's, it here. Yeah, it's weird. It's not out here because it's uh, uh, they they did it first over in, in the UK. Yeah, but uh, you could Google though this find uh, the sellouts uh, novella because it's in the New Yorker. Right. Yeah. So and then um, and then you, the, what's the what's the Jay Baruchel uh, sitcom going to be called? Uh, it's going to be called uh, Man Seeking Woman. Oh, Man Seeking Woman. Yeah. Early twenty fifteen. Yeah. Thanks so much for thanks for I really appreciate you reading all my stuff. You know, it's like a lot of these interviews people. Um, Will not have read any of the uh, books, and, uh, and and which is fine. I get you know because it's I know people are busy, but it, it really means a lot to me that you took. No, the time I was to laughing read out loud this reading this stuff. So I called Tucker Max actually uh, to call his contacts to find you, uh, <laughs> and they found you. Cool. So I'm glad you came on the thanks. came on the podcast. Oh, thanks for having me. What a really and you definitely it. inspired some of my. So you probably haven't read anything I've written, but because it's totally different type of stuff. But you definitely, I've definitely ripped you off a little bit in my own uh, blog posts and and essays that I write. Oh, cool. So oh, I can't wait to check it out. Yeah, I'll, I'll send you. Uh, I'll send you one where I totally ripped you off. Oh, great! And people liked it, but they were like, "Is it? This is like a strange new version of James." So, <laughs> and I couldn't. I couldn't go from there. I've ripped off you and BJ Novak because. Uh, oh yeah. He has Very similar, similar. Uh, flavor similar. to your stuff. He's great. Yeah, we uh, we have a lot of the same uh, influences for sure. And I and that's why I felt like with one more thing, B.J. Novak's book, a lot of that came from stand-up ideas he had, which he expanded into stories. Mm-hmm. Um, that's why I wondered if you had ever considered stand-up. Right. Well, that's a guy who's who's obviously a brilliant writer, but he also happens to be a great actor and performer, right. which is just like I mean, that's like knowing how to 
play guitar and sing? Like, what are the odds? You know, and if you can do both of those, it's it's extremely impressive. So for like comedians, and you've written for so many of them, who like. Like, I sort of see, like, someone like Andy Samberg, who you must have written mm-hmm. for on SNL. Oh, yeah. That guy's, like, an unbelievable talent. Yes. Uh, and did you and, a great, a and a great writer. And a, and a great writer, because he does all the, with, with his team, he does the Lonely Island stuff. Right. And, yeah, he's, he's, uh, he's really, really, sh- he's, he's, he's an excellent writer. I've, I've written sketches with him. He's phenomenal. Does he contribute a lot to this sketch? Totally. Yeah. He's, uh, he's, um, an A-plus full, you know, he, I, He's somebody who, I, if he if he wasn't in the cast of SNL, surely could have been a writer for the show. Because uh, that's true of most of the cast. In fact, a lot of them are excellent writers. Didn't they? Most of them start as writers. Like, didn't like Andy Samberg start as a writer, or was he always on the cast? Um, no. But you're thinking of maybe of, J- of Jason Sudeikis started as okay. a writer. Yep. And uh, uh, who else? Um, yeah, and he's not the only. Yeah, Tina Fey started as a writer. Yeah. Um, so there are a lot of. Uh, but you know, again, just like wow, you know, most of like in my writer's room, for example, uh, there isn't a single one of us who would ever, who would ever be able to to be on camera. Uh, uh, SNL though is, is is they they seem to find a lot of writers who can do both, which is which is a rare special thing. Yeah, maybe maybe because Lauren Michaels is a writer, he can kind of recognize both qualities when mm-hmm. he auditions them. Yeah, look at like Jimmy Fallon, for instance. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And and. Uh, Right, and Lauren actually was on camera a bit in his in his early days. He had a he had a show um, in Canada. I didn't know that. Yeah, uh, where he was mostly he mostly played like straight man parts. He wasn't like uh, stretching too much, but but um, uh, yeah, and I, when he was when he was starting out in in entertainment, he um, he was on both sides of the camera. Well. Um... Again, I want to really uh, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. And good Thanks luck with me. Spoiled Brats. I highly recommend. I want to. I want to read off the titles of all your books so people <laughs> know what to, to get. But I've got to. I've got to find the list because there's so many of them. Um, hold on one second. I've got it here. So and and all of them were great. I have to say, I devoured them right away, and they're all pretty easy to read. Not in the sense that. You don't use fancy vocabulary or anything, but they're all pretty good reads uh, to, for speed. The Last Girlfriend on Earth and Other Love Stories, Ant Farm and Other Desperate Situations, What What in God's Name, a novel, uh, Free Range Chickens, Elliot Allagash, a novel, and then Spoiled Brats. Now, the one thing I haven't read, actually, is The Married Kama Sutra. Oh, Yeah. Mary Kama Sutra. That's that's a book of cartoons that um okay. my my friend Farley Katz drew. Okay, and, and you wrote uh, the dialogue. Or? Yeah, yeah, I did the captions. Yeah, that's um that's based on a, a New York a New Yorker. It's a it's a it's a s- small like gag book. Okay, it's uh it's based on a comic that we did for the New Yorker, which was, uh, it was a, a lost chapter of the Kama Sutra, which is positions for married people. So the okay. positions are. I'll definitely have to so, read it so the as position, a married person. So the positions are, you know, uh, a little less erotic and a little more kind of uh, just a, <laughs> a little more kitchen. Uh, yeah, it's a, lot, a lot of it is has to do with with the dishwasher. Huh, that's yeah. funny. Well, I just ordered it as we were talking. Oh, so. thank you. <laughs> so now I have your full collection. Unbelievable! You're the best. Thanks so, so much. They really appreciate it. and great questions. And thank you for having me on. Oh, thanks and good luck. Thank you. For more from James, check out the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network at stansberryradio.com and get yourself on the free insiders list today.
For more from James, check out the James Altucher Show on the Stansberry Radio Network at stansberryradio.com and get yourself on the free insiders list today. AI might be the most important new computer technology ever. It's storming every industry, and literally billions of dollars are being invested. So buckle up. The problem is that AI needs a lot of speed and processing power, so how do you compete without costs spiraling out of control? It's time to upgrade to the next generation of the cloud, Oracle Cloud Infrastructure, or OCI. OCI is a single platform for your infrastructure, database, application development, and AI needs. OCI has four to eight times the bandwidth of other clouds, offers one consistent price instead of variable regional pricing, and of course, nobody does data better than Oracle. So now you can train your AI models at twice the speed and less than half the cost of other clouds. If you want to do more and spend less, like Uber, 8x8, and Databricks Mosaic, take a free test drive of OCI at oracle.com slash advance. That's oracle.com slash advance. oracle.com slash advance.